We are very honored to have a diverse faiths panel. And for me as an interfaith minister, this is a particularly beautiful moment. Our aim is to bring to you a range of perspectives on what it means to live with mental health conditions and to talk about what resources faith-based and practice-based communities can offer to individuals and to families. I attended the Chaplaincy Institute for Arts and Interfaith Ministries in Berkeley. There's a table out there that describes this very unusual seminary. And we delved in depth into many different world religions. It is not a seminary that's tied to any one particular denomination or even one religion. And you know, when I applied to that school, I thought I knew a fair bit about religion. You know, I had 12 years of Catholic school and I'd studied world religions. Personally, I consider myself very open, but there's nothing like looking at a topic as broad as spirituality through the different lenses of the world religions, through Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism and Christianity and earth-based religions and Sufism and Islam to take a topic and examine it through the lens of those different perspectives. What I learned is how very little I knew and how incredibly diverse and beautiful the religious life is of human beings on this planet. And I think it's with this aim that the Alameda County Planning Committee decided to have this panel of diverse faiths. The people that we serve in our mental health treatment and prevention programs every day come from a wide range of religious backgrounds. Some of their experiences have been positive, some have been negative, but very many people use their religion and their spirituality to cope with their life and their life's challenges. And if we intend to be culturally competent, there is no way that we can exclude spirituality and religion. It's got to be there. So I can say for sure that you are in for a wonderful treat with this panel. We have seven panelists. We're going to do our best to stay on time. Jane, sitting right here, is going to be uh, flashing three-minute, one-minute, and zero-minute warnings to try to keep people on time. <laughs> Let me first just introduce to you our distinguished panel. We have, first we'll be speaking Lee Chan, who is the Buddhist chaplain at the San Francisco Juvenile Hall and a stress meditation instructor at San Francisco County Jail. <laughs> now I just attended a high school graduation where there were 400 names being read and as we say, please try to hold your applause till the end because we'll use up a lot of time that way. Um, based on Lee's meditation studies and practice in Thailand and Burma. He has been successfully using a simple program, a simple ancient breath meditation technique in an anger control program at San Francisco Juvenile Hall and stress programs at the county jail and the VA Medical Center in San Francisco. His day job is visiting associate professor at UC Berkeley Graduate School of Education where he teaches courses in resource management to aspiring school superintendents and administrators. And Reverend Dr. Jasper Lowry, hey, <laughs> welcome, was born and raised in Oakland. He is founder and pastor of Eurojas Ministries, which specializes in serving people with mental and physical challenges, taking them off the streets one person at a time. In 10 years, his outreach minister has touched over 1,500 families finding homes, jobs, and even family reunification. He is co-chair of the Bay Area Action Council and the Faith Advisory Council for Alameda County. He assisted in the development of Clergy Cares, a group of local pastors addressing violence in their communities through street outreach, social service referrals, education services, health referrals, and crisis response to victims of violence. He is a member of the Planning Council of Alameda County Behavioral Health as well as the pool of consumer champions. <laughs> Imam Delmont Yusuf Wakia was born in San Francisco, California, and has been a lifelong resident of Oakland. He was introduced to Islam by the founder of the Nation of Islam, Mr. Elijah Muhammad, who passed from this life in February 75. 
He then began to study and follow the teachings of the Book of Islam, the Quran, in 1975 under the direction of Elijah Muhammad's son, Iman Din Muhammad, who transitioned the then known Nation of Islam to a universal community of Islam following the Quran and the life, example, and teachings of Muhammad ben Abdullah. In 1983, Delmont became a firefighter for the city of Oakland. And during his 19-year career, he has trained and taught in fire safety, fire rescue, emergency medical technician, leadership skills, emergency scene management, fire prevention, and code inspections. He is now serving as imam of a new Muslim community in Oakland named Masjid Tazbi. Rabbi Elliot Kukla is a staff rabbi at the Bay Area Jewish Healing Center in San Francisco. He was trained in chaplaincy at UC San Francisco Medical Center, specializing in mental health at Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. He has lectured and led workshops on diversity in sacred texts, spiritual care at the end of life, and Jewish healing. Before moving to San Francisco, Elliot served as the rabbi of the Danforth Jewish Circle in Toronto. He was ordained by Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles in 2006. He lectures and leads workshops across the U.S. and Canada for spiritual leaders and healthcare providers on stigma and diversity in Jewish sacred texts. He is committed to accompanying individuals on their unique, nonlinear journeys towards healing. He draws on expressive arts, mindfulness meditation, traditional and innovative rituals in his spiritual care. We got this perfect alternating thing going on. I don't know how that happened. Lloyd Powell here to my right is a mental health specialist and cultural competency coordinator in the Mental Health Services Division of Modoc County and a tribal enrolled member of the Chickasaw Nation. He uses Native American spirituality, such as sweat lodges, vision quests, and the medicine wheel for the treatment of mental health and coexisting disorders. His program uses the curriculum of the Sons of Tradition, a component of the White Bison program, with adults and adolescents. He also uses the Red Road to Sobriety Lakota concept. Both programs are based on Native American traditional healing concepts. Lloyd is a keeper of the Sweat Lodge traditions, a 12-year sun dancer, a pipe carrier, and a traditional southern-style powwow dancer. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Joan Stedman is the senior minister at the Oakland Center for Spiritual Living. Reverend Stedman has served in many capacities in United Centers for Spiritual Living. She has created curriculum for the national organization and has been a faculty member of the Holmes Institute School of Ministry for 13 years. She's a member of the Advisory Council of the Association for Global New Thought and participates locally in the Interfaith Committee for Worker Justice. In 2001, she was inducted into the Morehouse College Board of Preachers and in 2002, she received the Gandhi King Aikida Award for her contribution to peace building in the local community. In 2008, she received an honorary doctorate from United Centers for Spiritual Living. And finally, Dr. Meiji Singh is the chief psychologist at Portia Bell Hume Behavioral Health and Training Center in Concord, California. He served as Dean of Rosebridge Graduate School of Integrative Psychology for 10 years and adjunct professor at UC Berkeley for 16 years. He is the founding president of the Interfaith Ik Ankar Peace Foundation, where he currently serves as secretary. And the foundation is one of the sponsors of the Interfaith Center at the Presidio in San Francisco and is a cooperation circle of the United Religions Initiative. He was one of the founding members in 1964 of the Sikh Center of the San Francisco Bay Area, El Sobrante Gurdwara. He teaches Sikh scripture to youth and children, 
and he was the founding trustee and secretary of the Sikh Foundation of North America in Redwood City. Since 1994, he has been a judge for the International Youth Symposium organized by Sri Hemkund Foundation of New York. So I invite Lee to start us off, and we will move through with uh, 10 minutes from each speaker. Would you be willing to come up here? I think it would be better if we did that. Thank you. Hello. So the most difficult part of giving this presentation is doing it within 10 minutes. So I'm going to constantly be glancing down there for my time. I have two goals here. Okay, one is to simply convey the basics of Buddhism uh, to you, and then secondly, to share with you the experiences that I've had in jails, juvenile hall and county jail. Not necessarily related to Buddhism, but uh, as, as a meditation teacher. Um, but in addressing the questions that uh, were posed to us and asked to address, I have to give you sort of the framework of Buddhism so you know how uh, it's approached in that religion. Uh, there are different kinds of Buddhist sects, just as there are different kinds of Christian sects. Um, I am a Theravada Buddhist. This is the Buddhism practiced in Thailand, Burma, and Sri Lanka. Um, I'm not, uh, it's not the same as what's practiced in Tibet or the Zen countries like Japan, China, and Korea. But we all sort of share the same basic idea, so there shouldn't be too much difference. Um, for the most part, though, Buddhism is practice-based. Okay, it's not faith-based. In fact, the faith part is probably reduced to a minimum. Um, there is no reliance on an all-powerful God who is responsible for our condition. Um, we're responsible for ourselves. Um, and as a disclaimer, I have to say that I'm not a psychologist. Although Buddhism has been described as an ethical psychology because it, there's so much focus on the mind and doing what is wholesome as opposed to what is unwholesome. So, um, the main teaching of Buddhism, of the Buddha in particular, are called the Four Noble Truths. That's the basic framework I want to use to sort of answer the questions that were posed to the speakers about uh, understanding mental health issues and understanding recovery. Um, the Four Noble Truths are presented almost as a, a medical treatment procedure, so it fits very easily into responding, responding to the questions. Uh, and so I use the Four Noble Truths as a conceptual strain, framework to describe the Buddhist understanding of mental health issues. So, before I can do that though, there are two critical assumptions to Buddhism. Um, and this underlies everything. The first one is karma. Uh, the Buddhists believe in karma. Now, from a Buddhist point of view, that probably means um, wholesome deeds lead to wholesome results and unwholesome deeds uh, or actions lead to unwholesome results. Um, in Christianity there's a similar saying, as you sow, so shall you reap. And in prison we say, what goes around comes around. <laughs> Everyone seems to agree that that's true. <laughs> now in Buddhism action not only means physical action, like you know, hitting someone or helping someone physically, it also means mental action and uh, verbal action. So those are also taken into account. That's the first major sort of assumption of Buddhism. The second one is rebirth. Um, rather than looking at this life as all or none, uh, we believe, as do many ancient religions, that we go through many lives until we finally purge ourselves of the bad karma that we acquire through this journey. So we believe in many births, uh, many rebirths. And what, frankly, when I'm in prison, I go in as a volunteer, and I know I get that skeptical look, like, why are you here on Sunday evening and you're not with your family? I mean, what are you trying to get out of this? I have to remind them that Buddhists do believe in rebirth, millions of previous lives, and if you believe that, then, you, then I can look them in the eye and say, I have to believe that you and I were in the same family at some time in a past life, each one of us. I may have been your father, you may have been my father, 
uh, who knows, I, we may have been mother-daughter relationship. But they seem to under accept that, and uh, then we can go on from there. All right, so those are the two major assumptions, uh, karma and rebirth. Now, the first noble truth. This is sort of like in a uh, medical analysis, you know, trying to analyze what the problem is. The first noble truth says that life has suffering, a whole lot of suffering. So um, what is suffering? The Buddha actually defined it. Suffering is birth, it's aging, it's sickness, it's death, it's sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair, and a, a long list. Okay, so he's very specific, um, but also includes a lot of things. Um, in general, it's, suffering is not getting what you want. Okay, so for example, you want wealth, you want beauty, you want success, you want happiness, and not getting those things, if you want them, leads to suffering. Well, you know, if mental suffering is a mental health issue, then according to this definition, living is a mental health issue. <laughs> that pretty much covers everything in life. They're just, that's right, just different degrees of suffering, but we're all suffering sooner or later. Um, all right, that's fine. So that's the problem. Then the second noble truth, what's the diagnosis? What caused this suffering? Suffering is caused by specific conditions. Again, for example, wanting something you don't have, a bad intention, um, actions that are bad, past life karma catching up with you in this life. Okay? So suffering is not accidental. It's not considered to be bad luck. There's a specific cause for your current suffering condition. Third noble truth then, what's the prognosis? You know, what, what's gonna happen? Well, this is, this is the uh, upbeat part of Buddhism. This is hope. There is hope. Suffering can be reduced and eliminated. Now, if you succeed in eliminating all suffering, you've reached what we call nirvana. But in any case, then recovery is possible. Recovery is reducing the suffering in your life. Okay, now the last uh, noble truth, the fourth noble truth, is the remedy. Okay, how do we implement uh, recovery? Well, it's called the Eightfold Path, which leads to freedom from suffering. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, so this is not a social program, but a self-help program. It's a holistic, lifelong course of action. Uh, it's nonspecific, but it uh, addresses all suffering. Well, um, I'm running out of time. That's why I have that gasp I'm down to three minutes. So I want to get into the second goal, which is to share with you my experience. And to do that, I'm going to sacrifice one minute and ask you to practice the simple meditation that I do in prison, uh, both in juvenile hall and county jail. So if you just close your eyes, and just focus on the breath when it goes in and out, touching your upper lip. Just try to feel the breath touching your upper lip as you breathe in and you breathe out. Keep your mind focused on that contact point. It's kind of a tickly feeling. And if your mind wanders, and it will, and maybe after the third breath, just bring your mind back. Gently bring it back. Make an, be mindful that you've lost concentration and then make the effort to bring it back to focus on your upper lip. So we'll do this for one minute.
Okay, please open your eyes and become aware of your surroundings again. So that's the practice. We do it for five minutes in jail. And uh, the application then is when you feel anger, when you feel stress, no matter where you are, you could be on the street, uh, you could be addressing your parole officer or whatever, or you could be driving under a lot of stress. When you sense that you have that stress or that anger, a craving, um, whatever, focus on your breath three or four times. Take your mind off it, clear out your mind, just like a reset button. Very quickly, I've had um, kids in juvenile hall say that we do this, if they do it for 20 minutes, they feel like they've just smoked weed. And uh, they really feel relaxed and they've lost their anger. They don't know where it went, but they just feel like they smoked weed. One, one child told me, one kid uh, told me that he ch his perception of his mother changed after doing this, practicing it. His mother suddenly became younger and younger in his eyes before she came across as an older woman telling him what to do. And gradually he realized that she was really just a young girl trying to be a mother. Um, it develops patience. Also, it helps with sleep. Uh, some kids have told me they sleep better in prison now than they ever did at home. One prisoner told me that it helped his claustrophobia, being locked up in a prison. Now the kid told me he had clinical depression. I said, what does that mean? He says, that means I get a gray cloud coming over me when I'm in my cell. I can't move. My muscles are locked. I can't even get out to get food when it's food time. I said, how does, how does the meditation help you? And he said, even though I can't control my muscles, I can control my mind. When I focus on my breath, it releases my mind and I get my energy back. I've had one uh, person who was schizophrenic and he, when he finished practicing the first time, he said, he told me, you know, I'm schizophrenic and I've never felt so relaxed. And for a schizophrenic, that's really good. So I think I may have run out of time at this point. So thank you so much. To God be the glory. Good evening. I'm Reverend Dr. Jasper Lowry. Um, gosh, that's quite an act to follow there. I mean, he speaking of my, my eyes was probably still closed right there, but I want to take full advantage of my, my 10 minutes of time. And I want to dive right in where, where I'm at right now, where I'm living and what I'm doing. Um, many of you may have seen the article on Wednesday night, uh, Tribune paper. It says connecting where police can't. And it's a reference to the street outreach with measure Y and Oakland bringing down the violence and connecting in the community. Uh, those that are lost and that are uh, out there used doing drugs and selling drugs and oh we're just dealing with a whole lot in the city and it just lets you know really that our city is at a crisis right now uh, so I want to kind of dive in right there because many times when I'm on the street at night I run into some of the very same individuals that the mental health department is designed to help and support and serve and some of them are misguided some of them aren't led at all they're just kind of lost so part of what we do is being that I'm out there for a specific purpose, God has blessed me in a position to be able to utilize who I am while I'm out there doing a job. And in that, we catch those individuals in the net. And we send them into the proper direction so they can get the love and the embracing that we heard about earlier this morning uh, through the mental health department. And I just want to just start right there because you'll find that we have at least 400, uh, no, not 400, 4,000 that's homeless in District 1 in Oakland alone. That's District 1. That's West Oakland, uh, which is my area that we're out Thursday and Sunday nights um, monitoring. And many of those, 40% of those are people living with mental health issues and need a lot of help. Uh, I've run into numerous people in the parks. How many of you walked in the park at night? and found a men mentally ill person in the park sleeping. Uh, well, me, for some reason, I can see in the dark like that, so I can spot people out and call them out and, and then redirect them. So that's one piece of what we're doing. Uh, many of the people that I help and support that have come to me needing housing were people that were right on the verge of becoming uh, or going to the psychiatric ward. We've taken them same very individuals and uh, trained them and taught them First of all, by, by recovering them where they are to where now they didn't snap. So now since you didn't, let me show you someone who has that needs your help. 
So in you supporting now this person that has snapped, I've developed not only you, but I've also developed them. This is a system that we use in the community, and it's pretty much close to community reform that you can find without a dollar amount attached to it. So we've been able to successfully help at least 1,500 people living in these various conditions. Amen. Thank you, brother. To get off the streets of Oakland without uh, having to run and beg or wait for assistance or come with some bright idea that we were waiting to be funded. No, we just dove right in 10 years ago and began to meet people right where they're at and find the needs for them immediately. Some that were snapped that didn't have medications, well, we directed them to get their meds to get back stable. Now we can work with you from that perspective, now that we have you stable. Some in the beginning was going back to John George like it was the thing to do. And well, but each time they went, we was there to pick them up. So eventually, um, they, some folks we work with haven't been to John George in over four years. So that's, that's a blessing. Um, so the same various individuals that came almost finna snap, that didn't really have money, that came in with maybe GA, $300, became the community coaches for those that were on SSI. And that's kind of a system that works that if you can manage and figure out, plus as a ministry, fill in the gaps. Somebody say the gaps. We have to learn to fill in the gaps. Amen? Okay. Let me switch gears a little bit. A lot of what I'm talking about as I've tried to reintroduce, well, introduce it to the faith community, some of the pastors that I work with collectively through the Faith Advisory Council, Alameda County, Behavioral Health Care Services, uh, which has very few pastors, but then also the pastors that are in the Bay Area Action Council who's pushing policy that the people coming home from prison will be embraced and not just end up going back to prison. Don't quite understand mental illness. They don't really understand as far as they know, that guy crazy, man. Uh, so they don't quite know what all that means and how it happens and triggers and antecedents and some of the other uh, terms that lead up to you snapping or uh, sometimes just a bad situation in your family can cause you to snap. I've had a, a nephew who lost the uncle he loved and the nephew lost his mind. So in working through that, it's, it's, a, it's a great deal of education that the faith community has been missing. But being that we have been doing outreach and stuff so long, sometimes just opening up another ear is something that we're not ready to do because we've been doing that. So it's kind of hard to get them to really embrace where we are with the issues in our community in reference to mental health. But with all the support that we have in this room, I know that we can reach the church today. That's pull the clap right there. Praise God. We have to continue to keep getting behind the Jay Maulers and the Susan, Su, uh, Sharon Kings and the Gigi Crowders, the uh, Marilyn Thomas. We got to keep getting behind the people that see that that we're not asking for new money all the time. Sometimes money just needs to be redirected. Sometimes find where it can work. Find out where does it work, and just not leave anyone out of the loop, but add people into the loop and make this thing where it will balance out. Then we don't have. Then we all go to the government and tell them that we need for this system that we've gotten in place. So I just believe that God has brought us together today for a very special um, uh, time. And, and as Jay mentioned Ecclesiastics, this is the time for the faith community to come together. And many of you in this room are, are purposely responsible for this. And I, I, I take my hat off to you and I thank God for you and your families to put such a wonderful conference together with all these faith leaders at the table. And, um, am I doing all right in my time? Okay. All right. So I just want to thank you and commend you with that. Uh, some of the other areas that, that are of great concern is the housing. How do we have so many people that are homeless and we have so many empty houses? I don't know how that picture works. It's like, you know, I got so many. <laughs> we got to fix that. I have so many lease agreements with people and uh, people that can't afford the housing don't have credit that we've stood by to say okay if we help you to live over here we're going to monitor how you live and in that sometimes is more important than just watching a place sit there and turn dilapidated i got guys that made it on ga that got great skills 
that can go in and replenish and refix. Well, I'm an ex-maintenance handyman person myself. That's how I came and became involved with working with mental health individuals, working day programs for the developmentally disabled. They begin to find out people that had special needs could do something other than sit at the table and turn blocks and bricks. They would come over to me and I would put a screwdriver in their hand, put a broom in their hand. I would do things that, that was just not thought about with someone with a special needs. I had a guy that was uh, um, paraplegic in a wheelchair, spastic, meaning that his joints was almost turned back. I set a prop up on his wheelchair. This guy was able to sort papers with his elbow. And every time he came up with a colored paper, he would holler, uh, 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 I, I got one. Here's one right here. And we removed the paper. And it was a project that was through Sybase Corporation. They just needed their form sorted. There's all kind of ways and things that we can do to develop currency to push this system. So also, let's get behind each other and those that are really doing the work. And let's find out those areas that we haven't thought about that will embrace the entire faith community and our community as we reform not only here, but take this thing throughout the United States of America, helping these individuals with special needs that have special gifts and talents today. So that's, can, can we agree to that? We need to come into agreement that we can move and do something together. Amen. Pushing aside the denomination lines, the religious lines, uh, yes, I'm word of faith. Praise God. I believe that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Amen. Anytime you can take someone that I'm not only a member, but I'm a client also. Amen. I've had my time with the psychiatric ward in this city. Amen. So, but God brought me through that. He used that so I can be a better example in my life today for those that are living and still dealing with these issues and that I can lead them into a better place in their life where they can find out that they have not been left out. They've just been lost. They've not been forgotten about. We just couldn't find you. Some people come to my place. I say, man, where you been, man? They be looking at me like, how this guy? I've been looking for you, man, so long, man. Where have you been? They be like, this guy got to be nuts. Where have I been? And I, come in, come in, embrace them and love them. They feel like they've been knowing me 10 years and they've just been lost. And right from there, I've just met him where he is, found out from, from real comical conversation, not so stiff and, and firm where, I mean, you know, sometimes you can scare them to half to death because you're so firm and rigid. Just lighten up and deal with them. Sometimes they're, they're cartoon characters. You just need to act like you're watching another cartoon. And between you and the conversation, you will find them. And from there, then put on your serious hat and that professional uh, the degree. Somebody said there's so many degrees, you're frozen. The, I mean, then use that stuff, amen? But sometimes you need to just meet people where they are. Don't, uh, no matter what they look like, smell like, where they just come from. Thank you for your time and God bless you. have a ni another nice round of applause for the Dr. Reverend King. I mean, uh, Lawrence. Oh, uh, now you saying that was a hard act to follow. You knew what you were setting me up for. <laughs> well, that's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's why we're here. I would like to begin with God's name, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And um, I'm going to read a couple of verses from the Quran to uh, correspond with what we're doing here and uh, try and set the uh, stage for the few things that I have to say uh, concerning our gathering. Uh, first, I would like to say it's, it's a blessing, and I mean a blessing. It's a blessing to be here. I feel real good uh, being among the um, interfaith people and all of you. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. And uh, me being a Muslim, we have a lot of work to do. I don't have to tell you the latest things that are said about Muslims and Islam. 
but I just want to declare publicly that uh, the Muslim community uh, job, along with continuing submitting to the will of God, is and, and doing that is to make sure that you know that al-Islam is not al-Qaeda, al-Islam is not Taliban. Al-Islam is not black Muslim. Now, I'm a, I'm a product of the community that called themselves black Muslims. In fact, that was the name that was put on the community by the media that the community obviously gladly accepted. Uh, I'm a product of that. I'm a, uh, I began my Islamic journey under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was uh, quite radical, and I, that's really not a bad thing. Uh, our experience, we needed somebody radical to uh, tell us that uh, we, were, we were independent and that we can do something for ourselves. Uh, but fortunately, um, his, 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 his teachings was transitioned by his own son. And his son uh, brought that community in accordance with the Quran. Now, the Quran is a universal book. And I'm going to, these verses that I'm going to read from the Quran will uh, introduce you to its universality. So I will read the first verse, verse uh, 49, 13, if all you have Qurans. Uh, when you go home and pull your Quran out, read this verse. <laughs> for, for 49, 13, chapter 49, verse 13. <laughs> And it says, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. Verily, the most honorable of you with God is the one who has most regardfulness to God. Verily, God is all-knowing and all-aware. So in this verse, God is telling us that mankind is one, one. And our titles don't, our titles don't entitle us to superiority. Thank you. We're, we're all from one God. And the labels that we have, that's beautiful. Like uh, the, uh, the Reverend Laurie here, Say he, he stands firmly on, on uh, Christ, strengthening him. Your labels are beautiful. What, what we come in contact with in our life, when we're introduced to a concept of worshiping God that's very powerful. Very powerful because we have a devotional nature. We're born with the nature to worship God. So when we're introduced to that by our parents, by our environment, by our society, when we're introduced to how to worship God, that connects with that devotional nature. So when you believe that, believe that. We, we are in the, we're in the business, we Muslims are in the business of conversion, but we're in the business of conversion if you come to us. If you're seeking and you're searching and you're asking questions. We would love to convert you to be Muslims. I would love to give you all what we call the Shahada, and we all walk out here together as Muslims, hand in hand with Christ. <laughs> Christ and Muhammad walking together. I would love that. I would love it. But it's not real. It's not practical. One of the things now, now Imam uh, W.D. Muhammad, who's also known as Wallace Muhammad, who passed uh, last September 9th, he uh, told us, don't go trying to convert people. He said, don't try to convert people. Leave people where they are. If you feel good about your religion, practice that religion to the best of your ability. And those who want to become Muslims will become Muslims. And those who don't, they won't. But remember, God is the God of all people. God is the God of all prophets. So don't try to convert anybody to your religion. Just practice your religion. 
And when we do that, regardless to our labels, if we take that common thread, that common thread is in, in religion, common thread is what did God say? What did God say that was best? And we take what God said is best in our religion, we are practicing being kind to people. We're practicing looking out for people. We're practicing reaching out to people and helping people, and in particular the less fortunate. This is religion. No if, ands, and buts about it. That's religion. So if we stay in our separate or stay under our separate labels, and if we did that, we would all be together. Uh, it, was, it was good hearing from uh, Dr. Lee, who gave a disclaimer, he's not a psychiatrist, uh, a psychologist, and, and uh, Dr. Laurie and the rest, but it was good hearing from them and their outreach, going out, making contact with people. Now, it doesn't make no difference what our label is. If we're having problems with people, we're all going to have those problems. Now, Al-Qaeda is not checking to see how many Muslims getting on the bar train if they want to blow it up. They didn't check and see how many Muslims was in the uh, United uh, Trade Center. They did not. They do what they do regardless of where a Muslim is or where a Muslim not. So we got a problem with people doing wrong. We got a problem with everyone. So the, the objective is to reach people and make life better for people. Make life better for people. And if we do that, regardless of what our labels are, we're going to all have a greater life. We can't control our children, our children's mind, their direction, where they're going, what they decide. I was born and raised a Christian. I was born and raised a Catholic. My parents didn't have control over me to be attracted to Islam and accept Islam. I don't have control over my children who I raised as a Muslim to be attracted to any other religion or any other idea. Many of them attracted to other ideas that don't have nothing to do with religion at all. <laughs> and I don't have no control over that. So we have family members that belong to different faiths and do different things. So if we're working to make everybody's life better, it's better for all of us. If someone, if Dr. Laurie can reach my son, because I'm, I'm monotone to him now, he's heard what I had to say all his life. Dad talking. Let me give him that attentive look so he can get through. <laughs> so if Dr. Laurie reached him with what he was just saying and made him a better person, that's good for me. So let's strive hard not to get hung up on our labels. Love our labels. Love what we're about and practice the best of what we're about. The second verse is uh, chapter 17, verse 70. And indeed, we have honored the children of Adam, and we have carried them on land and sea, and have provided them with all good things, and have preferred them over larger amount of our creation and indeed we have honored we have made honorable the Arabic is we have made honorable all the children of Adam this is God talking this is this is your God this, this is this is your God whatever you refer to that God whatever name you give that God whatever name you've been taught to call that God this is your God talking in the Quran. And he says, indeed, we have honored the children of Adam. So everybody, the cartoons that Dr. Laurie was talking about has been honored by God. And if we look beyond the condition that they are in now and see that that is indeed a child of Adam, a servant of God in their nature, we go beyond what we see on the surface and we strive to reach them and to help them as we call on God to help us because we all need help. Just 
my mother told me, she said, be careful about what you say about other people's condition because you'll never know when there will be a slip between the cup and the lip. That was my wonderful mama with that wonderful wisdom. So in this uh, gathering to, to focus on uh, spirituality being a, uh, a method of healing, I'm going to go to my notes now and stick to my notes and just tell me when my time is up. Uh, oh, one minute. <laughs> my time is up. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to read it. From, from, uh, raise your hand. <laughs> from any disturbance, mental, spiritual, we are told in the Quran to say, I seek refuge in God from Satan the rejected. So God tells us in the Quran when, 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 when uh, we receive any negative thought, any bad thought, immediately seek refuge in God from Satan. We take everything back to God for guidance and answers. But you have to believe this is a book the Quran, it says, this is a book and it is guidance sure without doubt. To those who fear God and who are rightly guided. Those who are rightly guided. <laughs> Zero minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shalom Aleichem. So I want to start by offering you all and us all a prayer for healing. I invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable and receive it. It comes from me and from my tradition, but for all of us. Misha Barak Avotenu, may the one who blessed our ancestors bless all who live with mental distress, our caregivers, families, and friends. May we walk in the footsteps of Jacob, King Saul, Hannah, and Naomi, who struggled with dark moods, hopelessness, isolation, terror and yet survive to lead the Jewish people. Just as our father Jacob spent the night wrestling with an angel and prevailed, may all who live with mental health issues and emotional distress be granted the endurance to wrestle with pain and prevail night after night after night. Grace us with faith to know that though like Jacob, after this wrestling and during this wrestling, we might be wounded, we might be shaped, we might be given a new name by this struggle, and yet still we will live on to continue an ever unfolding, unpredictable path toward healing. And may we open our hearts right now in this room and realize that we are not at all alone on this journey, but surrounded by each other surrounded by our families, our friends, our communities, our ancestors, and by the divine presence. May we always be as surrounded as we are in this moment. May we hold the feeling of being cradled in this room when we feel most alone, and know that there is loving kindness, grace, and companionship for us, and spread over us a sukkot shalom a shelter of peace and wholeness and healing. And let us say, Amen. Amen. So I, I wrote this prayer originally to um, share with synagogues across the Bay, and it really grew out of my feeling of wanting to share the image of mental distress and healing as moments that we are all living through throughout our lives, both the moments of distress and the moments of healing. Right now at the Bay Area Jewish Healing Center where I work, I provide spiritual care to people living with illness, grieving, or dying. 
And I would say um, about half of my clients are identified as having mental health issues. Um, as you know, many of these experiences bring mental distress to the surface. And for me, doing this work was this huge sense of relief of having come from a family and a community with a lot of mental distress, of periods of hospitalizations that just sort of disappeared off the face of the community, and being entering into this world where all of us are sitting now, where these experiences are named and owned, felt like this amazing sense of relief. Of this is where life is. And when I look to Jewish tradition, and see that this is where life has been for many thousands of years. So the ancestors that I mention in this prayer all struggled with things that we would identify as mental health issues in our in contemporary community. King Saul, we learned in the Bible, had periods of extreme darkness, called in Hebrew ruach ra'ah, which is literally sort of a bad spirit would overcome him and he would be immobile in emotional pain and the only thing that would comfort him according to the Bible was David playing to him on a harp. He couldn't even get out of bed. Naomi, who I mentioned in this prayer, was so depressed after the loss of her children, was so stricken by grief that she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Don't call me pleasant, call me Mara bitter because my whole life has become bitterness. And Hannah called out in prayer in the ancient temple in a time when people didn't speak their prayers out loud and was considered by the priests, the Kohanim, as insane and kicked out of the temple for speaking out loud her prayers to an invisible God. And according to Jewish tradition, this moment of calling out her pain is the beginning of what we now call prayer. And Jacob, who I mentioned in this prayer as well, wrestles with this unnamed being, which according to the Midrash, Jewish commentaries, was actually himself, was his own spirit. And through this nighttime wrestling, he wrestled with this spirit until the spirit gave him a blessing, and then he went on his journey. And he was totally transformed by it. He got a new name, Israel, which literally means the God wrestler for having wrestled with this divine part of himself, which became the name of our whole people and went on his journey with a limp for the rest of his life and a new name, but that was what made him a leader as well. So these moments of deep emotional distress, many of the leaders of our people were not leaders despite it, but also because of it. As we heard this morning, they were all a little different. So this is the, the heritage that we stand on as Jews and as human beings. And I think for those moments of healing, we also have a lot of Jewish images that I want to share with you, just a few in my couple minutes left for recovery. And one is B'Tselem Elohim, the idea that we're all created in the image of God. As we probably all know in this room, thank you, in moments of emotional pain and mental distress, in moments of hospitalization, the self and to other humans and uh, mental health issues often lead to so many broken relationships and some of my work I feel as a rabbi working with people who are suffering is to show them how much power they have to repair these relationships and to show them where they might be in this brokenness and the power that's already within them for healing of relationship. We also have in our tradition a huge resource of rituals for naming grief. Uh, long mourning practices that mark the day, the week, the month after a loss. And when we're thinking about some of the losses that go along with mental distress, some of these resources can be drawn on. And sometimes often when I'm working with someone in the hospital, I'll draw on rituals for grief and for celebration to give meaning and shape because Jewish tradition acknowledges you don't start grieving until the funeral. We don't start grieving on the day of the death. We say that's just a sort of in-between limbo phase and people can't even be expected to grieve. It needs to be named publicly first. 
And sometimes the losses of mental illness are never named publicly, so we never begin to grieve. We also, in our tradition, the last tool I want to offer you, have a notion of yira, which is translated both as awe and fear. And sometimes these places of deep emotional distress are places of both awe and fear, of terrible pain and terrible terror, and sometimes also a sense of bigness. It can put us in touch with the bigness of the world, as some of the people who have spoken today, that a sense of holiness can often be connected with these moments of total disintegration into pain. And I think Jewish tradition's notion of yara, of awe, as Moses says when he stands in front of the burning bush, this very scary manifestation of God, the, the ground, and God says to him, take off your sandals, the ground you are standing on is holy. And whenever I walk into a home or a psych unit or a space where someone is suffering, I, have, I think of that verse. I take off my sandals, this is holy ground. This is ground where something very powerful is being wrestled with. So thank you. This is such a beginning. And I Good job. That means uh, we're all related, and that's uh, a Lakota word. Um, I'm going to kind of just jump around up here because uh, uh, for us, um, what I practice is an oral tradition. They have written some of the things down, and you could probably even Google them and find, <laughs> find some of this stuff. But basically, the, the teachings that I've been taught are uh, oral traditions. And that's the way we, uh, we present things. And if I have, say I have a young person or someone else that wants to follow these ways, it's done orally and with me one-on-one, -on -one, giving them the ideas of why this happens and the, the ideas of uh, the order in which they need to happen. Uh, what I practice is called the red road. And that's not, doesn't mean for red people. It means red blood of the people. Uh, we all have red blood. We're all the same. And that's what this is about. And this is a spirituality. It's not necessarily a religion. And, um, and that's because anybody can, can come into this or practice it. Some people try to own it. Uh, it's not something that you can own. Uh, one of the main ideas about uh, this Native American walk we call the Red Road is that uh, if you look on the internet or something like that, you're going to find people trying to sell it, charging people for um, this philosophy, this uh, way of life. Don't do it. Religion, spirituality does not cost. It's free. It was given to us by our Creator. And that's one of the main things. And one of the first things I was taught uh, when I came into this red road was that there is no cost here. I, we're all equal. Uh, there's no suit to wear, no certain clothes to wear, no, no anything. It's, it's open. It's open for all. I'm not, not unlike any of the other things that, we're, that we've been hearing here today, uh, it's, it's for, the, for all men, the poor man, the rich man, the black man, the yellow man, every person, male, female. Um, I'm going to start by saying a little bit about how I came into this. Uh, first of all, I am a, a family member of a consumer. I was raised with, uh, in a household of mental illness. My mother was mentally ill, severely mentally ill. I have 20 years of sobriety myself um, because of that. And, and this all started for me, I'm going to give a little history. This all started with me with, uh, I was raised in a very uh, fundamental Christian household, very strict. Uh, and for some reason, it's like a shoot that didn't fit for me. And I come from a mixed family, a mixed race family. I'm uh, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Lakota, and Irish or something like that. <laughs> We're not sure what. 
And so it was very confusing in this house uh, with a mother with mental illness. My father was a, a full blood off the reservation, uh, a runaway from the boarding schools. And some of you who know anything about the Native American boarding schools, how this could be. So our household was pretty confusing. I was taught that uh, the way to get somewhere was to work. Uh, that was the key. If you worked hard, you would get something. Education was not stressed. Our, I think the, the, the religion, the Christianity, which uh, could have been a very healthy thing, was not used in a healthy way. It was a punishment. It was used um, to give us fear, to control us. It was for control. If you're bad, you're going to wake up with the devil, all that kind of stuff. These scary things. So it didn't, for a child, that's not the way to get to their heart. You know, it didn't really work. So um, I, I rebelled against that uh, when I became a teenager, like most uh, teenagers do. Up until that point, I, I bought it all and lived in a world of guilt and fear and all that, like most children do. So I, um, I, I did my rebellion as a, as a teenager and went on through life as, uh, as they do and went into the service, all that. Still not finding my place, finding out who I was or what was going on, it was very confusing. Uh, I didn't identify as a native person. I did not identify as a Caucasian. I had both. It didn't, it didn't work for me. And I was told, uh, unfortunately, that I didn't fit in either world. Uh, being of mixed blood, I was told that didn't work. But um, again, so I, I did like other people would do that have those things. I became depressed, all that, and acted out and self-medicated and all those things. But to, to make it short, is I, I finally did end up um, in a uh, what's known as a sweat lodge. And some of you have, may not know what this, and I'll explain that in a, in a minute. And, when, um, and this is a Native American philosophy. It's a way of healing. It's a teaching place to teach. Elders come there. All that. It's a circle. We call it a choshpe, which is like a family. Uh, and coming to that, my first day in at this uh, ceremony, and I went into this uh, so well, you could uh, almost like call it like a steam bath. Uh, a lot of um, cultures have these. It's just done different ways. The Native American way is very earthbound, very earth earthy. My first day and my first time in the sweat lodge, I sat there in this circle uh, with the other Native people and some non-Native in this very hot. It's a very it's a hut and it's very hot. And they were bringing stones in, putting water and steaming. I centered. I found myself. Something happened. It's like people say it could be like the Holy Ghost. <laughs> something, something happened. It came into me. I found myself. And in there, I knew it was everything just came. I knew who I was. I knew what I was about. I knew what I wanted. Everything. And I was, uh, that was my first day of recovery. I didn't, uh, I, I came out of there sober, a sober person. And so with that, though, with that, with that ceremony, I started researching and trying to find out more, found out more about my culture, my family, hooked up with relatives back on the reservation and such, and found a reality that I, I didn't know about, uh, a truth that no one had told me that I would be uh, accepted into my community and, and, and such. But again, our, around the, the Red Road, as they call it, there's philosophies. And there's teachings, and one of the teachings is, is the medicine will. And with the medicine will, the medicine will is about balance. It's about finding one center. And that's a wholeness in yourself, a wellness that you have. You are responsible for it. No one else is responsible for it. There's no one between you and your creator. You don't have to go in through anybody. There are no confessions or anything like that. What it is is leading a life in, in a circle. Whatever, and the same as some of, most of these philosophies, what goes around comes around. Your actions will be, uh, come back to you if they're bad. They'll come back to you bad. If they're good, they will come back to you to good. And what it's all about is, again, finding the center. And we, we uh, celebrate the directions. There's teachings from each direction. The, uh, I come from one of the older traditions, the, and that is the teachings of the West. And, and our teachings of the West, that's where our spirits uh, lie. And that's where our, our uh, dreams come from. And dreams are very important to us in Native culture. Uh, unlike most Aboriginal people, they, they're important because they come, they, 
they're like a message from the Creator in our sleep. They talk to us. So, that, so we celebrate the West with that. The, the North is strength, endurance, purity, and truth. We, we want that. And then we have uh, East, and that's what we call the daybreak star. That's where the new day begins. Each day is a new day for us. We can start our day over. So say something happens and you do something wrong, you can start over each day. Then uh, South is uh, abundance. This is where all the things that come from us, to, to us, to help us. And then we have Mother Earth, the, the grounding, the Father Sky, the, the Creator, and then the within, the, the one that's important here, the within, the healing within our hearts. So uh, with these philosophies, I, I've started a um, mentoring program for juvenile, Native American juveniles. And uh, in my county, I did this on my, on my own, and then now it's been picked up by the county. Uh, they saw it, and it, it's been going on for about eight years in our county, so they, they like that. So now it's come into the court systems. We're using it in the court. Uh, and we give our juveniles an opportunity to take this red road if they want, or they can go the mainstream. It's up to them. It's not, there's no... Uh, re restrictions that say they, because you're Native American you have to do this. And it's also now been opened up to non-Native kids. So anybody who wants to take on to this, they can do this. I'm also uh, running the same program in uh, Lakeview Prison in Oregon also. So it's gone, it's, it's been a journey uh, just trying to find my own healing and finding my own ways turned into a whole curriculum for um, Native people and non-Native alike. Uh, I'm sure that if someone wanted to duplicate this program, there is somebody in your community is doing this already, I would imagine, because I, I am connected a little bit and I know that there's people in the Bay Area that are doing this. Again, the main thing that you have to watch for is if they charge, run away, because we don't, there is no cost for spirituality. So again, uh, what this does, uh, the ceremonies that we do, I couldn't get into them and give you each detail because it would take too long. But basically, again, the ceremonies that we do are for centering, centering us, finding our balance. And in doing that, you'll have good mental health, good physical health, and the, and the wellness that you need. Again, thank you. Good afternoon. It's so good to see you. It's so good to be asked here. I'm representing the New Thought tradition, and I was so glad that Sharon and Andre uh, got me into this program, actually, because at first it was like, what am I doing here? And then I thought, well, what a perfect opportunity, because how many of you know what New Thought is? A few, hardly anybody. So we are like the baby of all of these traditions. You know, we are only about 100 years old or so, a little bit over that. And um, basically what I like to call it is new thought, ancient wisdom. Because the reality is everything you have been hearing every panelist say is part of what we believe. Because the founders of new thought, which include uh, unity, it includes religious science, it includes the agape movement down in Culver City, it includes universal foundation for better living, and many, many other things. Those are the, the biggies, so to speak. But what, what the founders of these traditions did was look at the, the major world religions and said, what are the universal truths that are present? And then in new thought tradition, not only have they looked at those, but also how do we apply these in the healing of people? And when, when we're talking about healing, we're looking at revealing a wholeness that we know is already present within someone. And so I'm going to break it down to two basic things that we teach and, and get more into how do we work with people, how do we um, impact people's lives. And so the two things, and you've heard this from several panelists, the first is there is only one of us that there's one life in this universe and that life is the life of each one of us it is the life of every ethnic group it's the life of every s sexual orientation it's the life of everything everyone 
Every person, no matter what age they are, no matter what their lifestyle is, that life is their life. And so we approach everybody from a place of wholeness, that we see the wholeness in you, we see the perfection in you. So when somebody walks into our sanctuary or walks into one of our classes, the way they're held is you are already as beautiful and as radiant and as perfect as God could possibly make you because you're created in that divine image. You know, the way I like to think of it is God had this beautiful idea of you and so loved the world that God brought you into existence. And so when people walk in, they're held in this place. And so no matter what's going on with them, no matter what the craziness, no matter what the mental disturbance, no matter what the addiction, they're walking into what I call this vortex of wholeness. And because we're seeing that, it's, it's a place of compassion, it's a place of unconditional love. That's what we work with. Of course, we're human, so we keep working with it, you know. And then the second thing, the second principle that I want to mention is the principle of karma that several people have already mentioned here, that, that what basically what goes around comes around, you know, cause and effect. And what that means is, to me, what that means is what, what I believe I am at the very center of my being and what I... Uh, what my subconscious mind is telling me, what my subconscious thoughts are. These are the things that are going to outpicture in my life. These are the things that are going to create my reality. And so when, when we look at both of those, we first of all have people walking into this place where they're totally accepted for who, who and what they are. <clears throat> and we also have um, spiritual tools, you know, spiritual technology for people to use, so to speak. Uh, through and, and you've heard some of this on the media lately. If you've seen Michael Beckwith on Larry King or Oprah, if you've seen the movie The Secret, you know, all of that is, is typical of, of this teaching, although it goes much deeper than The Secret, I have to say, for those of you who have seen this. But basically, so what we, t what we teach people is, you know, you have power through your intention, you have power through your attention, in other words, I can form a new intention about my life and I can give it my attention and my mindfulness and I can create a different reality in my life. Now, there's so, there's so much to say. I'm in the same boat that all of you were in. <laughs> there's so much to say. But one, one of the things I want to say with regard to uh, mental illness, what's called, quote, mental illness, is that that the way I look at it and the way our teaching looks at it is that every breakdown, every illness is the opportunity for a breakthrough. That basically what's happening here, thank you. Basically what's happening is that our souls, our spirits are, are evolving. You know, that's what it's all about. It's about what's going on on the inside. And we have these human circumstances that allow us to grow ourselves, that allow us to use all of our potential. And, and I know for myself, to make this personal, my, my, uh, I've, I went through such a hard time because my oldest daughter, um, who was diagnosed as being mentally ill, who went through, uh, for various reasons that I don't have time to go into here, went through the foster care system, who was uh, gang raped during that time, who um, it, it suffered more than I can even, even imagine, um, that I had to work with that, you know. And I was a practitioner of this teaching at the time. And what my work with her was, as well as being totally loving and accepting to her as a person, and, and I could do this because of the teaching and because of the principle I had practiced, is that I had to see beyond all of the dysfunction, all of the stuff that I saw going on, and really see her as a God being, really see the divinity in her. And was that hard? It was hell hard, <laughs> excuse me. But it was hard, you know? To continue to see that, even when she'd be yelling and screaming at me and, and at everybody around her, and I had the strength to do it because of this teaching and because I had practiced mindful me mindfulness meditation, because I had been doing my, my daily prayer work. Um, and our prayer work, by the way, I know I'm here, there, and everywhere, but this is the way I am. What can I say? Our <laughs> this is the way. I have it all written down orderly, and then it just does what it does. So anyway, my prayer work, the prayer work we do is called affirmative prayer. You see, and, and I'm going to actually end my time with, ooh, three minutes, okay. 
way, with, with doing an affirmative prayer for you so you can get a sense of it. But the affirmative prayer is affirming the wholeness, affirming the perfection, because we know there's power in beholding, there's power in observa observation. Quantum physicists are saying that now. You know, the way we look at something is, is a way we can create. And so doing that work helped me through that time. We have in our communities, in um, religious science in particular, we have what we call uh, professional spiritual practitioners. And these professional spiritual practitioners are there to know the truth. After every Sunday service, they're there to pray with people afterwards. And to s people can simply sit in their presence and be loved. And, and have somebody speak the truth about them, speak the real spiritual truth about them. Um, they're, in a couple of weeks, they're doing what's called an evening of blessings, where people can just come in on a Friday night and get prayer and just be with somebody who sees the wholeness. Do you know the power of somebody seeing your perfection, no matter how badly you're acting out? I mean, that's a powerful thing. Um, one, of, one of the things, we have a pastoral care ministry, and that pastoral care ministry assists people in crisis, assists people who are grieving, assists people um, who are in the hospital, basically taking care of all the human emotional needs of individuals as well as doing the prayer. And then um, finally, I, I want to mention that one of the things our community participates in in August is East Bay Stand Down, where we go and actually are in camps with, with vets. And that is a piece of work where mental health is concerned. I have so much more. But um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a spiritual, what we call a spiritual mind treatment. So um, I'm going to invite you to be with me in prayer for just a minute right now. And if you want to keep your eyes open, closed, whatever. And so in this moment now, I recognize that there is one life in this universe, one mind, one presence, one power, one love intelligence, that one that is recognized in all faith traditions, that one that is the life of all creation. And I know that life is my life. I know that life is the life of each and every one of us in this room and beyond. And I take a moment now to speak my word for and about all of those who are feeling any sense of despair in their lives, any kind of breakdown, any kind of challenge. And I know that no matter what the challenge is, no matter what the, the situation, the condition is, that right where these individuals are, the presence is fully and completely for each one as a divine person made in the spiritual image and likeness of pure spirit. And so I behold wholeness, I behold perfection, I behold love. I behold and know that the, the loving arms of the infinite surround each and every one, that they are embraced in the divine. And I know that within each and every one of us, at the very center and core of our being, it's God's perfect peace, that peace that far surpasses any sense of human understanding. And knowing all of this, I just give thanks. For I know that the healing activity of spirit is taking place right here, right now. And so in great, great gratitude for the word spoken, knowing that in God it's already done, I simply release it now. I let it go and let God have its perfect way. And so it is. Amen. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I hope you can still stay awake. And so, well, I come from Punjab state, which was divided uh, during the partition of India. And when the Indian leadership betrayed the aspirations of freedom fighters. And I don't think any of you know, I was a high school kid. There were a million people killed in Punjab. There was total genocide on both sides. It didn't make any sense to me. And nothing I had read in history or literature could explain it until one of my professors introduced me to unconscious motivation. And I was lucky to get assistantship at Boston University. And I was very intrigued by analyzing the fantasies of my patients and finding out what the nature and source of anxiety was, what kind of defenses they used, and was really very useful. But in more than half a century of my practice, I have not seen one person who didn't have real suffering. And then 
during that suffering, they do develop certain ways of dealing with it, which then continuously repeat themselves. And then we put labels on people. Some are schizophrenic, some mental de depressive. It's quite of abuse which can invent. We do that. So my specialization since 1963 has been prevention. That the mental health people are very young. And my idea was to strengthen the already re existing relationships in the community. I won't talk about anybody else except I have consulting with the Council of Churches and Ministerial Association because they are the people who are always there for other people. And they don't shut up their door and say it's nine to five. And, and then people go to them during their life crisis. If we can help people during the life crisis, then they don't have to be called any names. So that was my journey through mental health. And uh, then we started this Portia Balhume Behavioral Health and Training Center. And Portia Balhume was my boss for 14 years. She wrote the Short All Mental Health, uh, Mental health Services Act. And, uh, which was passed by Charles and Doyle. And, uh, and we're trying to, and then she started this training center in community psychiatry to help people to do more preventive work. So that's just, to me, is a very important thing. I learned that now somehow people are really beginning to believe that all our emotional turmoil is genetic, it's biochemical. Of course, you can give drugs to calm people down, change their, but healing takes place with the human being who gives you a different experience. So, the, and then I'm a Sikh, and idea of being a Sikh is means, uh, literally means a, a seeker or a student, and the fundamental word is ik onkar, which means there's only one creator that manifests itself in everything and is also transcendental. So the essence of all being is this spirit. You, me, everybody is God. So then how come we keep fighting with each other? You know, it, the answer is simple. I'm also Meiji, right? So that spirit is experiencing itself, but it feels like being Meiji. But then what happens to me is that I get attached to being Meiji. I'm a Muhammad Ali of consultation. I have a PhD, I'm a Punjabi, I'm a Sikh, I'm a man, and on and on and on. More it's me and me, my spirit gets buried under this debris. So the purpose for me is being a Sikh is to reduce my attachment to myself and live in the consciousness and see God in everybody. So there's no mentally ill. So the, I'm, since I'm a psychologist, I'm more interested in the processes. Let me begin with Moses. Moses could have been the most powerful person on this earth at that time, but he got stricken with love and he left his power and liberated the oppressed. Then Christ comes and he says, hey, what the hell are you doing here? All these rituals and everything, love is the way, right? What did we do to him? We murdered him mercilessly, yeah? And then Hazrat Muhammad says, the slave and the, and the master are the same. What would they do to him? We tried to kill him. Luckily, he escaped to Medina. Now, who is mentally ill? Is Moses, Christ, or Muhammad, or their persecutors? Hmm? Who's mentally ill? Please? Okay. Do you know any persecutors now? Now, we are talking to the wrong audience. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not making it into an exaggerated claim. It is literally true that people who have power are mentally ill, diagnosably. 
and and you are and I are talking about oh you know we treat schizophrenia we treat mental depression I mean this is a joke and a very tragic joke can you imagine look at in your DSM-4 the definition of conduct disorder we used to call them sociopaths a person who tells lies person who promotes himself person who doesn't have any empathy who can dehumanize and kill a person without thinking twice right what are our leaders all over the world doing now so I'm not just doing this to, to make you feel angry with somebody I want you to be Moses I want you to be Christ I want you to be Muhammad you don't know my spiritual guide Guru Nanak to go with love there is a peace day in October don't make demonstrations go to them with love listen to them you know listening is the only way to heal this planet because when we started this Hume Center in memory of my mentor Dr. Portia Bell Hume and somebody asked us to start partial hospitalization program and Jay doesn't know I know him for ages I think we knew each other in the 70s and and so the first person I hired was Mary Carley who was also diagnosed with mental illness right I hired her to consult with us and be our colleague so we don't get into labeling people and and then one of our interns did a research on our partial hospitalization program and she interviewed all the people who went through it guess what they said what helped them most they said this is the place we feel respected like human beings and people listen to us and you go and people push you pump you with drugs and you can't even wake up so it the thing which we need to do I think this is a very good organization and there are spiritual people on my left and right if you know anybody who's your congressman and all the elite you know please go to them in, on the peace day and bring your love and ask them question and listen to them don't demonstrate just ask them how come that we're killing people in the name of Christ there's no Christian no Muslim no Jew no Sikh the Sikhs you know killed that some few young Sikhs killed in Vienna somebody they said he was respecting our sacred book not realizing they were betraying the person who wrote the book the book has nothing but songs of love and they were humiliating the book by killing in the name of the book please I'm involved with interfaith for last several decades so to me we don't need interfaith dialogue we need intrafaith dialogue to talk to our power elite who are still following Caesar who was following all the Mecca elite who are still following Aurangzeb if you know him so please love them pray for them then we won't have any trouble in helping people who are really casualties of their mental illness thank you I'd like to just ask for one final round of applause for all of the speakers here, distinguished panel. Thank you. Good job. Good job. I think the thing that I'm left with is that we have seen in their eyes mirrored back to us a reflection of our common humanity and the unity among us regardless of tradition, belief, faith, practice, diagnosis, 
our common humanity. Thank you for showing us that. Before too many of you leave, I have a couple of important announcements that you may want to hear. Um, first off, when the workshops begin at 325, Barbara Myers, the role of the minister workshop will be in this room at 325. So that was one program change I needed to announce. Also, the open mic session at the end of the day, at the end of the evening, beginning at 5 p.m., it says it's in the Jewett Ballroom. We're going to move that upstairs to the hospitality in Cal Simmons 1, 2, and 3. We're going to open the air wall so it'll be a nice, comfortable, cozy room for you. Whose ministry is focused on mental health issues. And um, I work in Fremont, California, which is just down the road from us. The charts that I'm going to be showing, I have copies of them here. So. Okay. So, uh, reason that I'm doing this workshop um, as a minister is that I know that many uh, people in, in congregations who have mental health problems in their uh, families, either themselves or someone in their family has a mental health problem, many times go to see their minister when the trouble first starts. And uh, having been in seminary myself, I know that uh, that is not taught in seminary how to deal with people who have mental health problems and and lots of times the, um, the ministers don't know what to do and, and they, uh, they um, may even do things that are uh, unhelpful at, at times to people. I have some handouts here for those of you who don't have them already. These are the copies of the charts that I'm going to be presenting. Thank you. So what, what I have done is put, to put together this information in order to educate ministers. And I know that all of you aren't necessarily ministers, but you probably have ministers that you know in your life. And my um, suggestion is that you might want to take some of this material back to your minister and uh, tell them that this is these are some suggestions of how to deal with people who have mental health problems in the congregation in the future. So that's why I'm here. Okay. When I have, um, when I talk in, in I'm many times a guest minister in congregations and I talk about my own experience with mental health issues and um, I do that not because my experience is so special but because I've learned that it is it makes it safe uh, you know if, if a minister comes out and says that they have had mental health problems then it's more likely that it, people in the community will be able to admit it and not be afraid to do so and so after I tell my story and I give some more information about mental health and what it means in the spiritual lives of, of uh, the people in the community, I um, ask them to stand as a way of, in public witness, as a way of, um, of indicating that either they or someone they love has, is living with a mental illness. And every time I've ever done this, which has been quite a number of times now, somewhere between 80 and 100% of the people will stand up. And they all are looking around amazed, and they can't believe that so many people are standing up. Um, and it suddenly becomes OK to be, talk about it in a coffee hour or with your neighbors or your friends because you saw them standing up. And then they share stories after the service and that kind of thing. And um, and it's, a, it's an eye-opener for the ministers that, uh, that happen to be there or, or hear about it 
to know that that many people that are sitting in their pews are literally filled, those pews are filled with people who are suffering from mental illness in one way or another. Yes? Will you repeat the, the amount? Did you say 80? 80 to 100 percent every time I've done it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was an intern minister, was this a Unitarian church in San Francisco? It was 100% on, you know, when I stood up the first Sunday that I preached there. I said, I'd like for you to stand in public witness if either you or someone you love is living with a mental illness. And they all stood up, or almost everybody stood up. Um, so, it's pervasive and, and it's um, tragic because ministers don't know what to do. So that's why I put together this presentation so there would be some suggestions for what uh, ministers might do. And if you have some other good ideas that aren't on the list uh, or if you have objections to something that I have, please let me know and I'd be glad to talk with you about it. Um, also, if you have any questions, we're a small enough group, I think we can just ask questions. So, yes? Campbell? Oh, yes, the donut Close. shop. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and there's just all this misdirected, yeah. you know, anger and rage and stuff. And one tenth of the, well, anyway, so, so I've been doing, I've been really upset with Danny. I've been going to the board on April 14th mm -hmm. locally. And, um, but, but the bigger thing that I'm protesting is, you know, the Campaign for the Mind of America is, you know, funded in great part by pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that, that whole congregation of the 80 to 100 percent that you see that you know, the family members diagnosed or, or they themselves are diagnosed is a result of the pharmaceutical industry and misinformation that, you know, having a psychiatrist have nutrition and spirituality as a So what you're saying is there's a need in the psychiatric community to understand spirituality as well. Well, at, at the psychiatrist level. Yeah, that's right. I mean, to collaborate with the psychiatrist mm -hmm. and help get the information around nutrition, like true health, mm -hmm. uh, and family Maybe we can talk about that afterwards or yes. at greater length, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the first thing that, that I looked at when putting this together is saying, what is it that minister's role is in this, in this area? And these are the uh, ideas that I have. Um, first of all, it's an, not a substitute for professional Care. It's an adjunct, and that uh, what the minister can do is impart a calm, reassuring presence, knowledge that the person is loved and accepted. I heard that in every one of the speakers that we had from every religion. Unconditional acceptance was just sort of the key, the groundbreaking role of that. Um, a uh, also, something that's very important is hope, which is necessary. It's necessary for the beginning of recovery for you to think that it's possible for you to get it better. And sometimes it's necessary for some, for other people to give you hope. I mean, some, sometimes other people have to hold hope for you 
why, before you realize that you have hope, you know, so um, that's really important. Um, some of you may know that I am the producer of a public access television program here in Alameda County. It's called Mental Health Matters. And the whole uh, point of the television program is to give people hope. And that's what I tell all our guests when I'm talking to them before the show is that the message I want to give is one of hope. Um, so this is what I think is one of the minister's uh, really important things uh, that, that need to get across. Uh, another thing here, visits when in the psychiatric ward. Um, some ministers won't go to the psychiatric wards, they're afraid of it or, what, or some, something. And, but it's a parishioner of theirs that's in the hospital and they should be visited just like any other person who's in the hospital. Um, and they should get uh, pastoral care and casseroles just like anybody else gets casseroles when their family, someone in their family gets sick. Um, the minister can give encouragement um, and tell people um, that it's possible to get better and give them encouragement, especially when they go, uh, as you know, sometimes people's recovery goes, has a roller coaster at times, that when they're in one of those down modes, to encourage them to, to stay up. Um, also the use, we heard some of this today, the use of spiritual practices that are consistent with the beliefs of the person. Uh, for example, prayer or meditation or communion or other rituals that might be important to people that can be incredibly powerful in order to have a person feel like they're, they're accepted. Um, if there is, uh, if someone is in denial or being disruptive to church life, the minister has an obligation to confront them in a loving way to let them know that that's not the way that we behave in this church or this is not being productive um, in, in your life. Uh, also, the, the minister can, can let the whole congregation as a whole know that this is a place where we do not tolerate cruelty, exclusion, or jokes at the expense of people who are mentally ill and practice that in everything that they do. So if they hear something, like that, they challenge it right away. So it is, this is not a place where we do things like that. Uh, ministers can give sermons or classes or pass out literature to educate the congregation about mental illness. Um, they can invite people to come and speak. I sometimes have invited, or they can have uh, uh, run classes, or they can. There's a lot of information from NAMI or FaithNet NAMI that we just heard about that can be given out to folks in the congregation. Um, and uh, finally, referrals to appropriate professional treatment, incur including handling of psychiatric emergencies. So if somebody is in real acute crisis, the minister should know what to do. So that's what I see as the minister's basic minister's role. Um, the next couple of charts have just some definitional stuff that you may already know. Um, what is mental health? What is mental disorder? Uh, these definitions are from the um, report of the Surgeon General in 1999. Mental, mental health is defined as a successful performance of mental function resulting in productive activities, fulfilling relationships with other people, and the ability to adapt and change and cope with this diversity. Mental disorder, on the other hand, are conditions that are characterized by alterations in thinking or behavior or mood and associated with distress and impaired functioning. And it's important to think about these things like this arrow does here. Uh, they're, they're on a continuum. You don't have everyone isn't either mentally healthy or have a mental disorder. There's this vast uh, um, distance between the two, and most people live our lives somewhere in, in between there, going back and forth um, in order to um, live our lives. And so everyone will exper experience distress at some time, and the things that help people get over mental disorders can be helpful to anyone who they're experiencing distress, even if that's not 
um, diagnosable um, mental disorder. Okay, so those of you who have seen um, this kind of information before, various categories, this is just, um, I've, I've uh, taught a class um, on, with a lot of this basic information at the Graduate Theological Union in um, Berkeley. And what I do with this is to just tell people this is how psychiatrists diagnose mental health problems. There are different categories of them, and th these are the various categories that there are, or, or at least some of the, the, the more common ones. There are mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, eating disorders, disorders usually first seen in childhood, and personality disorders. In reality, there are many more than that, but the, these are the ones that are seen most often. And there are just some examples here on you know, what kind of, of disorders that, that, um, that, one, see, that one sees. And the bottom chart here are, are things which they, they are um, not, off, not often thought as quote unquote mental illness, but they are, um, the criteria for diagnosing them is also in the same uh, psychiatric reference. And so, uh, so substance related disorders, so substance abuse or substance dependence, and um, cognitive disorders, including dementia, delirium, um, and various memory disorders. So there's a for a classification of the more common ones that people will see. Okay, so what is it that people can do um, if, if you're a minister and someone comes to you with saying that they have depression? Um, what this first, the top part just says, this is what how depression is diagnosed. Um, you have depressed mood most of the day, diminished interest. Um, there are eight um, symptoms and you have, there's a, uh, a classification of you have to have at least five of them or something like that for a certain length of time. But anyway, the, the depressed, um, insomnia, fatigue, worthlessness, can't concentrate, uh, recurrent thoughts of death perhaps, um, this happens to be the, the illness that I was diagnosed with, so um, a lot of those mean a lot to me. Well, what is it a minister can do if someone like this is in their congregation? Um, first, reassure the person that he or she is loved and accepted. Sit quietly with the person in a calm, peaceful place. And I've done this before with people, and um, and I just often hear people say, I feel better just sitting here with you, you know, even if I didn't say anything and just sat there with them, you know. Um, so there's uh, the, the power of presence. I think I heard that earlier today too, the being present there with a the person, just letting them be. Um, try to figure out if there are any religious struggles that are playing a part in their, um, in their depression. And if, the, if so, to discuss them with people. Um, encourage professional therapy. Support the person in the efforts to find medication that works. And as probably many of you know, sometimes that's agonizingly slow at times. And um, you know, sometimes there is, uh, you know, you have a false start or you try something that doesn't work and it's very discouraging, but just encouraging them to try to stick with it. Uh, suggest that they join a peer support group if there's one in the community or around. Um, might even have a start a, a support group in your congregation if, there, if there's people that want to have one. Um, there are general coping strategies for mental health consumers that are in the back. There's some sort of an appendix in the back of your, um, I guess it's page 17, if you want to take a look at that. I'll take a look at it right now it's because it's going to be. Now, 
this list is um, a list that, that I came up with as a, a leader of a depression support group for a number of years. And this was just a collection of here's what helps us, you know, um, ask people to tell us what helps. Um, and this was the list. So there's a number of uh, professional, uh, you know, getting professional or peer help. Um, so therapy, medication, support groups. Um, adding alternative therapies like acupuncture, acupressure, homeopathy, um, helping someone else, that's always a very important role, and working with a counselor. There's things that just this basic personal care, getting a good solid ba balanced diet, little or no caffeine, no alcohol, get plenty of rest. You know, so uh, personal care, um, stress management, exercise, so uh, getting your heart rate up uh, as long as it's okay with your um, physical condition, walking, jogging, swimming, running, um, and don't get overwhelmed. I'm, uh, this is one I have to keep teaching myself <laughs> um, continually. Um, then also just an awareness, learning how to recognize the warning so uh, signs of an, a, a coming uh, episode, you know, because a lot, a lot of us know that, that uh, recovery is sometimes an up and down thing, and if you can catch yourself while you're just on the cusp of going down, that sometimes you don't have to go down. <laughs> so just learning to recognize it. Um, and then doing something to make yourself laugh, cry, or get angry, as long as it's in a safe place. Um, life enrichment, indulge in some creative activity, like music planning, Painting, crafts, uh, weaving, that's the one I do. Um, take a class, engage in volunteer work, continue to be active with friends and relatives. And then spiritually, learn how to love yourself as an individual. There's no one on earth that's quite like you. You're all special, precious, unique people. And then various practices like meditation and so forth. The, the caveat that I have with this last one is some people, if they're actively psychotic, can find it to be disturbing to ha have silent meditation. So I don't, normally don't suggest that for um, people who are psychotic. So that's this, this, this actually applies to every, every one of these kinds. And when I tell people, ministers, is this make a copy of this page? Xerox it, give it to your parishioner. Tell them it's, take it home. Use whatever works for you, and you know. <laughs> um, okay, so that's page seventeen. That was.